Well, good morning, everybody, and happy Father's Day. Uh, I am glad to be a dad, and my family's in a lot of tra transition right now. My oldest son is uh, getting married in two weeks. This is, uh, this is new parental territory for us. Some of you have been through this before, and some of you have got younger kids. You think this is a really long ways away in the future, and I promise you it is not. Right, older parents, we can testify how fast those years go. We moved him to his new apartment last week. And then our middle son, he's going back to college. And then our youngest, our daughter, she just wrapped up her middle school career. And she is moving on to high school in the fall. And we were just part of an event called Transition Day. Because transitions take a little time to get your mind around. Transitions are often exciting and scary. I've learned they can also be expensive. <laughs> we try to plan for transitions. We can't always know when they're coming. We have people in our church who just recently lost jobs due to automotive restructuring. You can't plan for that. Most transitions, however, can be anticipated. They can be planned for. Uh, we have a family in our church that's relocating to Germany this fall because of a, a job transfer. And they just got back from a scouting trip where they're looking at houses and schools and churches. Generally, generally the, the, the larger the transition, the more planning and thought and prayer are required. And today and next Sunday, I want to talk with you about the ultimate transition. The ultimate transition. The transition promised to all who trust in Christ Jesus. The transition from this life to the life that is to come. There's a lot of confusion about heaven in our day. Uh, a lot of the Bible teaching about heaven are done with metaphors so they can be hard to understand. And when you look at a Bible uh, passage like the book of Revelation, uh, it can be unclear whether we're reading about what happens after we die or whether we're reading about what happens after Jesus comes again. And are those two things the same? Are they different? And I'm going to clear up all of that next Sunday. <laughs> next Sunday is going to be a doozy. We're going to go deep on what heaven is like. Today, I just want to whet your appetite for the future and maybe calm some fears. I find that in our day, we don't think much about heaven, and I think that's because in our day, we don't like to think much about death. Now, may I remind you that much of what the Bible has to say about heaven is not about where you go after you die, but about the kingdom of God that's available to you right now. Eternal life is available today. It's not something you wait for. You can have it as soon as you connect with God. Having said that, we do believe that life continues after physical death. That death is a transition that awaits every one of us. In the United States today, the death rate still hovers right at 100%. Right? <laughs> Maybe you heard the story about the florist who got uh, two orders mixed up on a busy day. There was a, a business that was having a grand opening, and there was a family that was having a funeral, but the deliveries got mixed up, and the guy with the business stormed into the florist shop and said, look, my business had their grand opening today, and you sent a bouquet of flowers that said, rest in peace. <laughs> and the florist says, I'm very sorry, but you, you think you've got problems. You should see the family that just left here. They had a funeral, and their bouquet said, good luck in your new location." And Lamott says, for a Christian, death is just a change of address. But even a change of address can be unsettling. And I find that even people who have the assurance of heaven, who have, have placed their saving faith in Jesus Christ, even those people have mixed feelings about going to heaven. We think, uh, I, I know I'm supposed to want to go there, but honestly, it sounds kind of boring, and I don't, I'm not really a big fan of harp music, and I like my life here so much, I'm not sure that I'd really be happy separated. And so in the moments that remain for this message, let me try to whet your appetite by reminding you of three metaphors that the Bible uses to describe heaven. Three biblical metaphors about what heaven is like. And the first metaphor we see repeated in the Bible is this one here. I've got some props to help us today. 
It's the image of a crown. The Bible has a lot to say about crowns. Uh, look at this first passage. The Apostle Paul is writing this. He says, I've fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing, a crown of righteousness. Then this passage from James Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So there was a crown of righteousness, there's the crown of life, and then uh, here's another passage, 1 Peter 5, 4, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Crowns, and some of you are wondering, what, what's the big deal about crowns. Do I, do I want a crown? I, I, you think I, I don't look good in hats and it messes up my hair and why would I want one crown, much less three crowns? Because in the Bible, a crown is a metaphor. It's a symbol for reward. It's a symbol of divine pleasure. Imagine standing before God and knowing that you have pleased him. There is in each one of us this innate desire for affirmation, for acceptance, for belonging, to be valued, to be regarded as special. That's in each one of us. And in our world, that gets junked up with sin and selfishness and comes out in unhealthy ways like arrogance and competition and jealousy. But imagine for a moment that all the sinful junk around it has been purged away. And, and imagine this, standing before God, and God is delighted that you exist. And you delight in his delight. No inferiority, no competitiveness, no arrogance, just pure joy. C.S. Lewis writes about what it might be like on that day. This is what he writes, these amazing words, C.S. Lewis. In the end, that face of God which is the delight or the terror of the universe, must be turned upon each one of us, either conferring glory inexpressible or inflicting shame that can never be cured or disguised. He says, I read the other day that the fundamental thing is how we think of God. By God himself, it is not. How God thinks of us is not only more important, but infinitely more important. It is written, we shall stand before him. We shall appear before him. We shall be inspected. And then he says, to be loved by God, not merely pitied, but delighted in, as an artist delights in his work or a father delights in his son. It seems impossible, a weight or burden of glory which our thoughts can hardly sustain, but it is so. That's what the crown is about. One day you and I will stand before God and he will be delighted that you exist and you will know his delight. I want to say another word about this because this idea of reward is such a prominent theme in the New Testament. Last Sunday we looked at this verse from Matthew chapter 5 from the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. We see this theme often, again, in Matthew chapter 6. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Good, noble, humble acts done on earth will be rewarded in heaven. Now, this has led to all kinds of speculation about heaven and about what it will be like. Uh, do, do some people get a, get a crown with extra jewels in it, or does everyone get the standard issue crown? Does everyone get the same room in heaven, in that heavenly mansion, or do some certain, do certain people get upgrades, like with an ocean view or better access to Jesus or those kind of things? There's a lot of things we do not know about Jesus, about, about, uh, about heaven and life with Jesus in heaven. Uh, but I think that's not quite the right picture. I think what we do know about heaven is it's a place of perfect community. 
So we know that no one in heaven will feel a sense of uh, inferiority or being left out or excluded or feeling second class. We know that. But the biblical teaching on reward is clear that what's done here has eternal consequences. Uh, Acts of servanthood, obedience, and faith that we think went unobserved, unnoticed, and unmarked here were in fact not unnoticed after all. So let me ask you a question this morning. Do you ever get discouraged? Maybe you lead a Bible study and you wonder if it's worth it. Or you do acts of servanthood and you think no one notices. Or you use your spiritual gift, but you've got one of the gifts that is not especially visible. And you wonder if anybody notices and cares. And the good news is somebody does. Heaven does. And a crown awaits you. Divine reward. The second metaphor that we'll look at today, uh, we're using this chair to represent. This impressive-looking office chair is about 30 years old. They don't, they don't make chairs like this anymore. When, uh, when a chair like this was designed, it was designed not just to be a place to sit in, but a place to command from, right? And the biblical metaphor is a throne. Now, uh, we, uh, thrones were hard to find for this morning's sermon. Uh, office Depot no longer carries thrones, Um, So we had to find this chair. But a throne is the supreme example of a chair that's not just a chair. It's a command center. It's a seat of power. It's a place where you call the shots from. Now this chair, I've actually heard Ward Church employees refer to this very chair as the throne because this chair once belonged in our office to a, uh, a, a, a... a senior, uh, our, our, our executive pastor who had a very commanding uh, presence, and we had to take this down from the attic because nobody will sit in this chair. Nobody will use this chair in their office, but I'm thinking about it. <laughs> now, again, in the Bible, the image is a throne, and in heaven, who sits on the throne? God, Jesus. Uh, Correct. Look what it says in Revelation 3.21. Jesus says, To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. God sits on the throne, and he invites us, those who overcome, to sit on his throne with him. God invites us to rule with him, to partner with him in God's work. This is incredible. In heaven, we don't sit in a recliner. We sit on a throne. In, in heaven, there is work for us to do. We, we, we imagine heaven sometimes as some eternal retirement village, but it is not so. It is the command center of the universe, and there is work for us to do. Does that bum anybody out to hear that? Were you hoping that, 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 that work would be finished in heaven? Heaven is not the end of work. It's the end of frustration. It's the end of the curse that's been attached to work in this world. So we will experience work in heaven, but it's work like we have never known before because you and I have never known work that's separated from the human curse that goes with it. In heaven, you and I, that'll be a place where we, we can create and contribute and reign where our desire for that can be perfectly fulfilled. There we partner with God in his creative work throughout the universe. In Jesus' day, the image for that was a throne. In our day, maybe we would say, come share the authority of my office. Come sit with me in the command center. That's the invitation. Luke chapter 19 is the story of the, uh, it's the parable of the, uh, the talents. You know this story. The master gives out varying amounts of money or talents to his servants. He goes away and he comes back to see what they've done with those gifts. Now, we often teach that as how to use your gifts here in the church or in the world, and that's fair. But I want to point out that the story is about a master who goes away and then returns. Uh, This is about what happens when Jesus returns. On the day of the Lord, our master returns. And then the parable of Luke 19, 17 says, Well done, my good servant, the master replied. 
because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. And later in verse 19, he says to another servant, you rule over five cities. It sounds to me like God will hand out assignments there based on how we have handled, handled assignments here. What we do in this life matters. I like to think that God will give me some meaningful work to do in heaven. Again, I don't know how that works. Maybe God will give me a small division to lead or a committee to moderate or some really cool event to plan. I don't know if people need to be taught in heaven or will everybody already know everything. I mean, I have this image that in heaven, every joke I make will be funny and every point I make will be profound. I don't know how it works. I'm hoping that in heaven I get to lead some uh, meeting of, the, of elders. And I know some of you are thinking, you want to go to a board meeting in heaven? That doesn't, uh, that doesn't sound like heaven to me. I've been part of board meetings, and no, that sounds like the other place. That, that's, uh, there's a, <laughs> I've this weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, but I like board meetings, and I imagine this elders meeting in heaven where there's only one agenda. It's God's. Nothing else creeps in. And listen, at Ward Church, we have elders meetings that get really close to that. We, we got to taste here in this world what we will taste in fullness someday in the future. You know, I, I had a big surgery a, a year and a half ago uh, to clear up some colon cancer that I had been diagnosed with. And I'm doing really, really well. And right after this big surgery, the doctors wanted me to walk a lot to get my system back in line. And the place that I went in those days after my surgery were this little strip of woods uh, between my neighborhood and the golf course. And that little strip of woods became my refuge. Uh, it was a place for me to restore, not just physically, but spiritually. And I would talk to God in those woods. And one day I was walking, uh, talking to God, and a golf ball comes streaming right past my head. At the place I was at that time and place, I really thought God was trying to kill me. <laughs> and really, I stopped and said to God, really? Really, God? You can't wait for the cancer to do its work? And then I flipped from anger right to arrogance. God, what could possibly be so important that you need me there right now? Can't Moses and Elijah handle things for a little while longer until I get there? Someday you and I will take our place with Jesus on his throne. We will partner together with God in his reign throughout all eternity. The last biblical metaphor, there are many of the last biblical metaphor we'll talk about today will be represented by this playhouse. The the most frequently used metaphor of heaven and the future is, is the idea of a home, of a home. And we see this lots of places in the Bible, but most clearly it comes from the words of Jesus himself. He said this, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And the significance of this metaphor is that in that day, you and I will finally be at home. At home. You will fully belong. The Bible, Old Testament and New, has a lot of talk about aliens and foreigners and strangers and exile. And the Old Testament prophets talked about one day God will gather his people out of exile and he will bring them all home. And when you read those prophets, you realize there's a lot going, going on beyond just the physical exile happening in that moment in history. This is a prophecy about the future, that one day God's people will all be fully at home, that we live in this world as strangers and aliens. And there are times where every human is aware of that. You brush up against stuff and you realize you're not, you're not fully at home here. And there's a reason for that. Your heart is somewhere else. 
Heaven is our real home. And so let me ask you, who do you know that's not headed for this home? Who do you know that's separated from God? Who do you know that might need help finding their way home? That's our job. Maybe the greatest reward in heaven will be the souls of men and women who come to you and say, thank you. You know, you, God used you to help me find my way back home to the Father. I don't know what I would have done without you. You were like my transition consultant. Home. One of my jobs in my family over the years has been to drive our kids to school. And I've been very fortunate to have been able to do that. One day, many years ago, I was dropping our daughter, uh, Gracie, off at first grade. And it's a, it's a curbside drop-off system. They, they don't want parents getting out of the car. And I don't know why I did this. I had not done this before. But on this particular morning, I leaned over her. I, I, I gestured like this, inviting a kiss on the cheek. And she kissed me on the cheek. And then she turned her head, and I kissed her on her cheek. And then she got out of the car and went into school. I wasn't trying to start a thing. I was just in a silly mood. But the next day, for whatever reason, we were in the car, and I went like this. And she kissed me on the cheek, and she turned her cheek, and I kissed her on her cheek. And we have said goodbye to each other just that way every day for the last seven years. She's in eighth grade. Yeah. That's not... uh... Now, honestly, I I thought one day our little thing would stop, that, you know, in middle school, I envisioned there there could be a day where she would say, Dad, you can't kiss me anymore in front of middle school, right? And in fact, I'd like you to drop me off three blocks away, and I'll walk the rest of the way in. If you could get down real low in the car so none of my friends see you. But she hasn't said that yet. Maybe she'll say that when she gets to high school, but knowing my daughter, I, I I don't think she will. I think it's quite possible we will say goodbye to each other just this way every day until the, the big drop-off. Now, I'm speaking in very traditional terms. I know things are changing, but traditionally, the big drop-off between a father and daughter happens not in front of a, of a school, but in front of a church. Not on a school day, but on a wedding day. Not driving a van, but walking an aisle. Maybe, maybe it'll be this very aisle. And I've thought about that day. Now, I don't know if if that should be wearing a veil or what the the fashion will be 40 years from now. uh, (laughs) uh, But I I pictured that day, and I I, I know what I'm going to do. I've planned it out. I'm going to lift the veil, and I will go like this. Sure. And then I will take her hand and I will place it into the hand of a very undeserving man. (laughs) A man I will simultaneously love and hate. And the privilege of kissing her goodbye each morning will pass to him. Now listen, right now, Gracie's not looking forward to that day much more than I am. The, The thought of marriage at 14 years old is terrifying, is it? should be for anybody of any age. (laughs) Right now, she likes her life with us. Right now, I don't think she minds that I'm the main man in her life, but I know that this will change. I know this is changing. I can see it changing. Already, she does not find boys as disgusting as she used to or as she ought to. (laughs) She's growing up. And the day is coming when she will want something else. She will want someone else. And that day, I think she'll realize that life in our home, as wonderful as that was, was just kind of a staging ground, just the preparation for this whole other life that is to come. Another thought had occurred to me because I was diagnosed with cancer. And again, I'm, I'm doing really, really well, full remission. But it had occurred to me that when that day comes that another family member, another male family member will need to stand in my place. It's possible. And to be honest, when my prognosis was looking grim, the thought of missing this one day bothered me more than just about anything else. 
seems like a small thing in the scope of loss, but I had very specific conversations with God about this day there in the woods. God, that is my walk to make. Again, I'm doing very well, and I have no plans to miss a day like the one that I'm describing to you, but it has occurred to me it is possible that our final kiss will be exchanged not at the front of a church, but at the side of a bed. And instead of me escorting her to her new life, that she will escort me to mine. Now listen, right now, I'm not looking forward to that day any more than my family is. I love my life here and my family and my church and my work. I'm not asking for anything more than I have right now, but it's only because I am immature. The day is coming when I will be all grown up and I will want something else. And I will realize that my whole life here, as wonderful as it is, was just preparation for this whole other life to come. In the end, a wedding and a funeral have a lot of similarities. I know that sounds like the start of a bad joke, but it is not. A wedding and a funeral have a lot of similarities. Both a wedding and a funeral are a celebration of the life that is. They're both a celebration of the life that will be. And there's some grief in the transition from one life to the other. A wedding and a funeral are very similar. Now you say, well, they don't, they don't seem similar. A, a wedding is a happy event. A funeral is a sad event. But if that's true, why do people always cry at weddings? And why does almost every funeral involve some laughter? Because both a wedding and a funeral are a celebration of the life that is. They're a celebration of the life that will be, and there's some grief in the transition. So there should be no surprise that the dominant metaphor of life in the next life, of life in the kingdom, of life in transition, is the image of a wedding and a house. Jesus is like a groom, and we are like a bride, and the bride and the groom belong together. And just like the wedding customs of Jesus' day, he has prepared a place for us, and one day we will be fully at home with him. So it's okay if right now you don't want to leave your home here or your life here. That's okay. But one day you will be all grown up, and you will want something else, and you will know that you were made for him and then your real life will just be beginning. Next week, we're going to talk about seven myths about heaven. Seven things that you thought were in the Bible that are, in fact, not there. And I think we're all going to be a little surprised about what the Bible actually says. Would you bow in prayer? Maybe you're here today and you haven't thought much about heaven recently. In an attitude of prayer right now, I want you to imagine what that day will be like when you see Jesus face to face, when you delight in his presence, when you no longer will know pain or sorrow or guilt or regret, when everything will be made, made right. If you're a follower of Jesus here this morning, just tell him thanks for your eternal hope. And then I challenge you to say to God right now, God, whatever time I have between today and the time you take me home, whatever time that is, I pledge myself to you. My marriage, my life, my work, my friendships, whatever time that remains, I devote myself to you. And if spiritual life is unfamiliar to you, maybe you will say to God now, God, I know that I'm going to die someday. I want a greater hope than I have right now. I ask you to forgive me. I claim the promise of heaven as my own, and I give to you my life. Father in heaven, thank you for life eternal. Thank you for the hope of heaven. Thank you that we can be yours forevermore. 
In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.